We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Defiance on Pi Day, March 14th, 1980. It was written by Thomas Michael Donnelly, based on a story by Donnelly and Mark Tulin, and directed by John Flynn. This is the second film for us that's been released by American International Pictures, who previously released the um, Mad Max international mm-hmm. release. Um, they were founded in 1954, but 1980 was the last year they were in operation. We will cover all six of their releases in 1980. They went out with a bang. Yes. Uh, making of, this is our second Bruckheimer production also, mm-hmm. um, after American Gigolo. And this film is mostly famous uh, historically for having inspired a stalker to attack actress Teresa Saldana. Um, Reading from the Wikipedia page here, on March 15th, 1982, Saldana was stalked by Arthur Richard Jackson, a 46-year-old drifter from Aberdeen, Scotland. Jackson (laughs) became obsessed with Saldana after seeing her in the 1980 films Defiance and Raging Bull. He obtained Saldana's address by hiring a private investigator to obtain the unlisted phone number of her mother and posed as Martin Scorsese's assistant, saying he needed Saldana's residential address to contact her for replacing an actress in a film in Europe. Jeez, they're yeah. creepy. This is a really elaborate drifter from Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Scottish drifters. Always be wary. <laughs> I just like that that is the only claim to fame this movie yes. will have. <laughs> um, Jackson approached Saldana in front of her West Hollywood residence in broad daylight and stabbed her in the torso ten times. Oh, what? no. With a five and a half inch knife, nearly killing her. Oh, gosh. Nearly <laughs> killing her. His attack was so fierce that the blade bent. Although there were many onlookers, including children, the attack was interrupted only when a delivery man, Jeff Fenn, intervened after hearing her cries, rushed to the second floor of an apartment building, and subdued Jackson. She recovered after four hours of surgery and a four-month hospital stay at the Motion Picture Hospital. She relived the incident in a made-for-TV movie, Victims for Victims, the Teresa Saldana story, and again for an episode of Hunter, which I'm not familiar with. That's just... One of those like Law and Order style shows that does a fictional account of a real life attack, but she had to act out her own attack twice, fictionally. That's horrifying. Yeah, the attacker served 14 years in prison for the assault, and making subsequent threats against her and her rescuer while in prison. Uh, he was then extradited to the United Kingdom in '96 to be tried for a 1966 robbery and murder. Jackson, who once saw himself as the benevolent angel of death, was found not guilty by diminished responsibility in 1997 and committed to a British psychiatric hospital where he died of heart failure in 2004 at the age of 68. So, no longer a threat. Uh, Jackson's method to find and approach Saldana inspired Robert John Bardo to hire a private investigator to contact Rebecca Schaefer, a young TV sitcom star who he subsequently murdered. Oh, jeez. Also in West Hollywood, July 18th of 1989. So that's a little bit of backstory about this film and what happened <laughs> as a result of it. And a, wow. another film, obviously. I mean, I, I, I was surprised, you know, when you, you said that, you know, she had like, Oh, she had a stalker. Oh, that's kind but of cute. But also, it was, a, it was so, that story was so inspirational. Yeah. That it caused somebody else to and be And then uh, it says here that after explaining the entire plot on a podcast. <laughs> no! Multiple more murders were inspired. <laughs> Don't uh, do no, people. don't don't murder anybody don't there. Murder We're people. in the clear. I said don't murder people. Um, they found they found the three podcasters in their garage. <laughs> the killer had a zoon in his back pocket full of vintage video episodes. <laughs> We're not even sure how he got them on there. This film belongs to a subgenre of vigilante films called nobly racist vigilante films. Ah, yes, yeah. That I think Charles Bronson uh, popularized. Uh, we start the film. Tommy has been kicked off of a boat in yeah. New York. I, I, I was already on board because there was no opening credits. Right. And I was like, oh, 
Great. We're just getting right, right into, into it. Right into the story. Yeah. Uh, then it tricked me. Yeah. And then we have <laughs> eight minutes of opening credits. credits. <laughs> like, God dang it. <laughs> we got a little cold open here. Um, he's stuck for six months in New York because somehow he like lost his seaman's license. Yeah. Basically. They don't really go into what caused this other than some sort of a disagreement with some guy on the boat. You need a license for semen? Apparently. <laughs> Only to carry it. Yes. <laughs> Concealed carry license for semen. <laughs> I hope to God it's concealed. The, what, the, the license or the semen? <laughs> you have to conceal everything. Everything should be concealed. Uh, it seems like he beat up either the captain or an officer. Because there's, yeah. there's a guy who's got like some injuries on his face. And, and they, have, like, they lock eyes for a yeah, second. Yeah, they lock eyes. Uh, but yeah. he says as he's getting off the boat, I put up with that guy's shit for six months or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, does that mean... That eventually you didn't. You didn't. That that would be the assumption. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming he's like a he's like I, don't know, I guess a longshoreman isn't the word, but I'm I'm assuming he's in, he's in some kind of union that you can file a grievance right. with that would give him a suspension and uh, which is, but it seems like the I don't I don't know what the rules are, but it seems kind of really unfair if you spend your life on a ship. Living from ship to so ship. So you could be you... suspended from one for six months. And then, like, just like, say you can't go on these ships. Don't yeah. suspend them from every boat. Like, you can't, You have to find a place to live and try not to die. Yeah, with your zero dollars. <laughs> but he also... So he's getting escorted off the boat by what seems to be a friend. Yeah. Uh, who presumably just went back, got back on the boat and left with everybody else after he walked him off. But he turns to the guy and he says, and this doesn't pay off anywhere later in the film... He says, when you get to Bremen, take some flowers to Mara. Tell her I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So, like, he had a girlfriend, presumably, or something, some kind of a relationship with a person where they were supposed to be going. I'm pretty sure it was a prostitute. (laughs) That he's paying flowers? Yeah, you have have your lady that you go see. Maybe. They don't play him off as that kind of guy for the rest of the movie, but maybe. And now he's not going to see her for... Ever? (laughs) Well, I guess ever, but... Yeah, but uh, so he wanders into a bar, and the bartender tells him, yeah, it sounds like you got a crap deal, um, but my brother-in-law owns this apartment building, and you might have a place to live there if you want it. And then he says, yeah, have some more orange juice. And he pours them what looks like just vodka or yeah, yeah. something. Um, but, like, I don't know why you would recommend somebody go stay at your brother's place or... You know. I met this great guy. He has no he job. Has no money. He no can't prospects. Even... He's real down on his luck. You should give him an apartment. He can't do anything <laughs> for six months, guaranteed. And then we get the montage of dilapidated New York over the opening mm-hmm. credits. Lots of people standing on fire escapes, looking into the alleys behind their apartments. Yeah, it seems like that's what everyone does in New York, I guess. You yeah. just stare at people out of windows and doors and balconies. You can't go out on the streets because this fantastically costumed street gang is running right. around you also oh, can't go into your apartment for some reason <laughs> i just love the way gangs dressed in the 80s according to movies yeah. so and according to like every grand theft auto map it's wonderful it's so much more flamboyant i think than gangs dress now i feel like we should go back to the days when you know they decorated themselves very elaborately yeah yeah this guy looks kind of like zorro-esque the, the yeah. leader of the souls and then like the subsequent like the second in command is like straight out of the warriors yeah yeah and then there's a, there's also one of the guys looks like axel rose like he's got like long blonde hair and a ponytail with like mm-hmm. the handkerchief over his head that's like our tolkien white guy because yeah. we wanted to make sure that we you yeah. know, made sure that multicultural both sides gang. were slightly diverse yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a very diverse cast yeah um lots of different shades of brown in this gang <laughs> tommy finds the brother-in-law's apartment building uh and he walks with his like duffel bag up to the stoop and leaves it at the bottom of the stairs um and as he's walking up to the door the gang is coming down the sidewalk and they see it on the ground and they're like no littering or something they pick it up and throw it up to the top of the stairs i thought they were just being helpful yeah they they throw it to him and then they smile yeah and i was like oh well that's i guess that's intimidating i thought they were just gonna take it yeah Yeah. right or like kick it or tear something out of it yeah it's like take take your bag Take it up into your room. Yeah, get <laughs> like, this stuff off the streets. We're out here cleaning up the city. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they both smile. Like the the gang leader smiles at him, and he just kind of smiles back at him. Tommy goes to see Karinsky for a job, and he like the first line. He's just like, "I need a ship, Karinsky." And then Karinsky's like, "Well, I'm not a magician. 
you know, I'll do what I can. I, but you guys are always asking. He's like, Kerensky. I need a ship. I forgot what the next line was. So I'm going to say the first line again, but more forceful. Yeah. That all was, right. All right. Like that was the point in this movie for me where I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what we're in for. And this isn't good. <laughs> yeah. That was the first indication that the that this one did not get a Golden Globe for screenwriting. He finds out that if he wants to work on one of the Panamanian ships, that he needs to be able to speak fluent Spanish. Right. Which, of course, he does. Right. He insists that he does. Right. Cut to a vinyl record of of learning language. How else do you learn a language in the 80s? I mean, don't cassette tapes exist at this time? I actually don't know. (laughs) Google. I know that there were eight tracks in the fog. Yeah. But, uh... Maybe it's a matter of yeah, uh, the, the fog, equipment the f- that he had. I, yeah, I guess she did have eight tracks. All right, cassette tapes came out in 1964, so I'm so going to no. go with yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so, cassette tapes have changed too over the years. Like an eight track is a cassette tape, also. I mean, I guess we can just assume that he picked this up like at a secondhand goods store, and yeah. it's just like this is all I got is this record. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of money to throw around. But records like. What, per side is like a max of like 10 minutes maybe? Yeah, it seems like he's only going to learn like 12 words. Yeah. But somehow he's on this same record all night. But yeah, so he's trying to learn Spanish and the neighborhood kids are making fun of him because they can hear it through his window. Mm -hmm. And he leans out to try and talk to one of them and his upstairs neighbor pours a bunch of water on his head because she's watering the plants on her uh, fire escape. And and you think in a neighborhood where you see everybody out on the fire escape all the time. That you'd check you, first maybe? yeah you you would check before well maybe she happened to know that that apartment was vacant mm. but um, and all the subsequent apartments below and her. the sidewalk on yeah, the, uh, yeah well is he, he on like the, out. he's on the third floor so he's not super high up but yes all three are empty um <laughs> and uh she's like oh my gosh i'm so sorry i didn't see you down there and proceeds to just walk down and walk into his place like she dropped a flower pot on his head it's like yeah. no, no no i literally just sprinkled water on you doesn't matter to anyone you wouldn't have even gotten out of your window the the fire escape seems to be the preferred mode of enter and exit for all of these buildings throughout the movie yeah she doesn't just go down to his place though like she barges in through the window right and she's also not wearing like daytime clothes in any of scenes of this movie. yeah the entire movie she's she has a different nightie for every every scene nightgowns and all like like Sexy nightgowns in all of the seats. <laughs> Except for the most appropriate attire she wears when she's bowling. Right, exactly. <laughs> so she walks into his apartment and just starts like commenting on all of his crap. And she's like, oh my gosh, you're a painter. I didn't know you were a painter. And it's it's like, like, I didn't know you existed until yeah, five seconds ago. You didn't know anything about him. Why didn't you tell me you were an artist? <laughs> I haven't said a word yet. I, 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 I do... I do like that this is just happening. Yeah. <laughs> She's just... forcing this relationship. And he just walks away. Oh, yeah. yeah. He just goes to the other room and she's like, oh, wait. Yeah. She's like still talking, still talking in his living room. And then she hears the door close and she turns and she's like, oh, he's not very friendly. <laughs> Danny Aiello is out yeah. on the street posing with a fish that he caught. Oh, it's <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> because... Like, this whole thing is, like, happening, and it's, like, this weird slapsticky where people keep trying to get in the photo, and he's like, yeah, don't you know how to use the camera, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the fact that this is happening at all is very bizarre to me. Yeah. I'm just, like, you're in the middle of, like, Brooklyn the city. or Yeah, you're not, like, like on like, the dock. You're not on you didn't the just dock. catch the You didn't fish. just get off the boat. You're not on the boat. It, you're in the middle of the street with a giant fish in your hand taking pictures of it. This yeah. This is a 100% a sewer caught fish. Yeah. That's why he's so proud. A sewer codfish? Yeah, yeah, from the storm drains. What you say that, that that's a thing? <laughs> I'm saying it's a thing. It's not a thing. Uh, but I like that he—he's can- the one from New York. He should know. Oh, I'm not from New York. What are you talking about? You, uh, you're, you've spent more time in New York than we have. I haven't even been. I've never been to New York City in my life. <laughs> well, where do you catch your sewer fish? <laughs> uh, but he hands it off to somebody while he's trying to talk about the camera. But but then in the the weirdest like most cartoonish moment. He lifts up an invisible fish as if he's still holding yeah, it. Yeah, right. like he doesn't realize yet that he's not holding it anymore. And, and he, he and then like, he Where's looks at fish? his hand. Where's my fish? <laughs> uh, I, I felt really kind of bad for Danny Aiello at this moment. Like he's like, oh okay, yeah, you know, it's, this is this is it. He's not the only actor I feel sorry for in this. I mean, obviously Teresa Saldana didn't need to get stabbed ten times over this movie, 
Not that she should get stabbed for any movie. I don't know that this movie really needed to be named is the reason. Like, I think Raging Bull by itself could have been like, yeah, he I'm saw sure Raging could've. Bull, he fell in love with her, and that's it. But like, this guy this movie called out nothing to do with it. He called out Defiance specifically. Oh, all right. so. all right. um, but yeah, so the it turns out this kid that was with them on the corner took the fish and immediately is running with it. Um, Danny Aiello and the rest of the guys are catching up with him. So as he passes Tommy's stoop, he throws it into Tommy's arms. Mm -hmm. Which, coincidentally, Danny and all these guys live in the same building right, with right. Tommy across the hall. But they just happen to be, you know, a few blocks away when this chase started. Where he caught the fish. From the <laughs> On the corner. <laughs> right. Is that is that really what they're implying? I don't think so. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Richard's just making things up now. I feel like if that was the implication, they would have shown him pulling it out of, like, a sewer grate or something. But... Anyway, uh, the kid throws the fish to so Tommy. so fresh. <laughs> <laughs> it, maybe he's just like, look at this huge fish I just bought. <laughs> like, he's just that impressed I want impressed a picture by with this fish I bought. Uh, Tommy just catches this fish standing on his steps. And it just, like, basically lands draped across his arms. Mm -hmm. But it's bleeding all over him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, bleeding. it is bleeding. <laughs> When, when he gives the fish back to Danny Aiello, because Danny Aiello it comes around. It was just wet. It wasn't blood. He has blood on his arms. All right, all right. I Re don't know. You have to rewatch it now. I've seen Fine. it twice. Fine. But uh, when Danny Aiello comes around the corner, he's like, what are you doing? He's like, I've seen her talking to my fish. What's it look like I'm doing? And he's like, he's talking to his fish. It's a wise guy. Why don't you give me my fish back? And then he gives him his fish back, and he just laughs about how his arms are covered in blood because this kid threw, like, a wet fish at him. So he goes back into his apartment to work on his Spanish lessons again. But but we're also like following Danny Aiello for a while, like too, oh, sure. too, yeah. too too long of a while. It's like oh are we are we changing focus on this film to Danny Aiello? Because uh, it goes like just follows him around for a little bit and then it cuts back to to Tommy. Yeah, but nothing nothing of consequence happens. Yeah, and this happens a few times too because it happens with the gang members too where they're just like. So what's up with this guy? What what what's his yeah. story? But I'm, nobody knows. So I'm, I'm going to talk to this random old man who came into this bar for ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so yeah, Tommy is is uh, back in his apartment trying to learn Spanish. But there's really loud music playing from across the hall where Danny Aiello lives, and uh, all of his buddies from the from the sidewalk earlier are in there listening to music. And he starts pounding on the door and he says, look, you got to turn that music down. I'm working here. And they're like, get a day job, and <laughs> laughing at him. And they turn their music up. And he takes a basketball and starts throwing it at a wall. This is such a childish competition to be like, oh, you want us to turn our music down? We're going to turn it up then. And like, then he oh, goes and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to throw a basketball at the wall. And your stuff's <laughs> going to fall off the wall. And then you're going to turn your music down because you don't want your stuff to fall. And it's like, well, no, they'll just, they'll come and beat the crap out of you. Or yeah. take their stuff down so that it doesn't fall off the wall anymore. But somehow this works and they turn the music down because the guy's throwing a basketball at the side of their apartment this uh, is our first instance yeah. of defiance yeah this is, <laughs> this is exactly keep track folks <laughs> Tommy uh, heads down to the local grocery store and befriends Abe played by Art Carney yeah uh, he's the local grocer and uh, he asks if he can basically use the phone as his own phone until he gets his, his own phone set up and Abe says, yeah, that's fine. I'll just, uh, I'll shout into the courtyard whenever someone calls for you. And if you don't answer, I'll assume you're not home and I'll hang up. Mm -hmm. And if you do answer, then come get it. Man, phones were weird in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's, I think, because I, I still think they even had party lines in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, and for those who, who are listening, who I, are too close. I know what a party line well, well, is. Now, now you some... could just walk right into a party, but yeah. you used to have to wait for a while no. before you could go into yeah. a party. So for those who are listening who don't know what a party line is, often uh, several homes or buildings would share a phone line, and you know, you'd know you have to wait for someone to not be using it or be a snoop and listen in on other people's conversations. But uh, yeah, because people weren't making as many phone calls traditionally back in the day. Yeah, I just think it would be interesting if he actually called up towards the apartment building and the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'll be down. And like five minutes later, he walks, you know, across the block to come answer the phone. Like, who's yeah. going to sit on the phone and wait for this guy? Well, he's coming. And he's only on the third floor. So he, he even <laughs> makes the point like, oh, I won't have to yell as loud if you're only on the third floor. Like he does this for people on the eighth floor of the building. <laughs> but uh, while he's in the store, while Tommy's in the store with Abe, a gang walks in and just takes everything they want. 
and then they say put it on our master charge which i'm sure is code for thanks for the free stuff that that he has their card on file and he yeah yeah no whatever. exactly <laughs> there's there's a running tab and they maybe they paid him a bunch of money in advance so they would have a credit um probably not though uh tommy leaves the store and one of the gang members is basically following very close behind him until tommy turns around and he and he threatens to bend a six pack around his head yeah which i thought was a weird way to say anything well you know th- those uh, little plastic things that the six pack oh you in. threatening to like sea turtle him <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh man i'm gonna co- slowly choke you as you grow over this ring <laughs> i'm gonna put plastic straws everywhere you swim <laughs> The guy's like kind of shocked that Tommy even turned around to say anything to him. Yeah. And he turns to look at his guys across the street. And the rest of the souls are like, whoa, who is this guy? That he doesn't just put up with us following him around. Mm. He seems really defiant. Defiant. <laughs> Act two of defiance. Uh, but then Tommy decides to go ride the subway for no reason. Yeah. And then use the subway bathroom. Really, all he needs to do is go home and learn Spanish still. Yeah. Where where he was going to or from, we don't know. All we know is that he brought, one, a six-pack of beer, and two, his watercolors. <laughs> like, he brought a bunch of paint, and it's literally like a watercolor easel. I didn't know you were an artist. I'm just surprised the gang didn't, you know, pick up on that. Yeah, why didn't they? Why weren't they so shocked? But yeah, so they, they follow him into the subway, and... Uh, beat the crap out of him yeah it, the worst choreographed fight scene maybe in the whole movie it, i wouldn't even call it a fight scene yeah, like like the, look, i hate fake fake kicking in fights oh it's, yeah it's terrible because it, it's like you didn't even pretend to, to kick though like yeah. they pull their legs back and they never even swing them forward toward the actor yeah like they're being so safe that they're not doing anything right, right. cooper like, huggaby gets whipped in django unchained yeah he's like actually well, it bleeding like, it's like that is real but like I don't like you don't even as an editor understand that you, like they're just like these long shots in this bathroom here where they're pretending to kind of kick him and push him around a little bit like you know you're supposed to like cut away just to kind of hide those action points yeah. but mm-hmm. nope they just linger on them and that one guy even swings a bat towards him and it clearly just hits the wall on the outside of the bathroom stall but it but he like reacts to it like he got hit and it's like no 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 we saw the bat stop like. We saw where it made contact with the wall. It didn't hit you. But um, it's a badly choreographed scene. And they take his paint when they're <laughs> leaving because they're like, oh, cool, free free loot. And uh, they go to uh, a nearby club where they do their business. Yeah. This scene is completely I, unnecessary. My, my note is, what is this scene about? Yeah. Well, okay, so I was really confused by this scene. So in, yeah. so in this scene, you know, we see, we see him at this club and, um, you know, he's there, you know, the leader of the gang is there with like this girlfriend and I think he gives her the he paint. gives her the paint right. she is playful with it and like puts some red paint on his nose which again like i'm not sure why they do this and then this guy comes up like an old an older gentleman um you know also probably puerto rican or or whatever ethnicity this you know the same as the gang leader yeah. and he's very respectful like, super respectful <laughs> And so, so I'm thinking, okay, cool. So this guy is basically like down on his luck and needs help. And so, and the right. guy basically gives it to him. I'm like, oh, are we trying to humanize this gang and say, does oh, he? Yeah. He does, does he need help? Doesn't he just sit down and say, I got a job working somewhere in dishes. Brooklyn. And then he leaves. He doesn't ask for anything and he doesn't get anything in return. No, I think he does get something. Maybe not. Maybe I'm misunderstanding, but I thought he he like gave him something cuz he said thank you and left and I thought, "Oh, he's we're trying to show that this gang is like, you know, th- that they're actually good. Like they seem like they're a nuisance and they're a menace, but they're doing good for their community." But then that doesn't you know come to fruition at all through so the rest of the film. That's I, not what this is about. I, I didn't get that from the scene. I got that that he was maybe coming to look for assistance and changed his mind when he no, sat down Well, because angel like says something to him and then he says thank you and i think it was more just like hey good you're luck doing a good job yeah like good luck out there and like, i felt like they were trying to bring to mind the scene from the godfather on the wedding day when people are coming and asking for favors and he's like dealing out justice to people yeah but nothing happens in the scene he sits down and he says hey just so you know i got a job washing dishes at this place down in brooklyn so i'm going to be doing that and he's like all right well i wish you the best of luck and then he makes some joke about like 
oh yeah i'm a stockbroker stock broker. and he's like well you could have been like hinting at like that he had some potential that he's wasting on being this gang leader but then they never come back to this we never see this character again we never see him deal with anyone else in this club again and it just it's totally pointless what i thought the point of this scene was because and i was very confused for a long time with the movie i thought that his girlfriend was the neighbor Oh, okay, oh, and I thought that they were pulling a rumble in the Bronx, where like the, the girl, like is the one like, that's supposed to be helping him, is yeah. And, and it, but it, but it's but she's actually tied up with this gang, and you know because it's just what she does, yeah, uh, to stay safe, and you know maybe she does care about the guy, and so then she finds him in the hallway, and it's like oh man, now she's seeing like firsthand what what the gang is actually doing to people. No, no, no. I was like much less interesting movie, <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> So that's why I was trying to rationalize this scene. And I went back and was like, wait, this isn't her. Yeah. What was this scene about? What was the point of this whole scene? They could have cut very easily from him taking the paint to her finding his body at the bottom of the stairwell yeah. at the apartment building. I guess um, this, the passage of time to make to make it seem like he crawled his way back to the apartment. Yeah. So uh, she finds him there and starts calling for help. And then we cut to him waking up at her place. Which is um, the second time this year that we have seen... Uh, somebody get beat up and have to spend the night in the neighbor's apartment. <laughs> yes, the vigilante waking up in the neighbor's bed. Which is harder to reach than his own apartment because yeah. she's right. up another floor. She carried it, him past his door at to least, her door. At least when we saw it in uh, Hero at Large earlier this year, like his apartment was like locked and you know yeah. inaccessible by either of them. But and neither of them is paying rent. That's another thing they have in common. <laughs> then the the story takes another left turn, and uh, we meet uh, the kid and Wacko. Um, there's a, a literal child, like an mm-hmm. Oliver Twist of the of the streets, and he's hanging out with Luca Brazzi. Yeah, as the, and obviously the actor's name isn't Luca Brazzi, but he played Luca Brazzi in the Godfather movies. Um, so that's what I'm going to call him. And the uh, character's name is Wacko, and yeah. he's like a, <laughs> seems to be mentally handicapped. Yeah, he he's an ex professional boxer who probably the implication is that he took one too many hits to the head right and he's just not totally with it and he's as much a child at this point as the The actual child yeah (laughs) Yeah. and the two of them together are finding garbage that they can sell to people and they they claim to make an okay living doing this Uh, yeah scavenging is a it was a good business but they're just picking up like rocks and poking them with the knives that they have in their hands like it doesn't look like they're actually like you're not going through recycling or anything. Hey, if you can convince a guy to buy these rocks and you get money for it, then true. all the power to you. Like the pet rock. <laughs> the guy made a million dollars. He calls Tommy ambassador for some reason. Oh, because he's learning like a foreign language. And oh, okay. So he's like, pretend- oh, they- he makes a joke yeah, at the window. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the foreign ambassador or something like that. Okay. I forgot about that, but you're right. But yeah, so he's calling Tommy the ambassador as he walks up. And he says, oh, have you guys seen the sewer alligators? And they're like, what are you talking about? There's no alligators in the city. And he's like, oh, the sewer alligators. It was, uh, it was a thing a while ago. A bunch of these kids had pet alligators and their moms were flushing them down the toilet. And then they came down to the sewers and bred. And they said they're getting like 14 feet long down here. And he's like, no, I never heard about that. And they're looking down a pipe and he hucks a rock into it to freak them both out. But that's actually the plot of a movie called Alligator that we will be reviewing well, later this year. But also, it's just a classic urban legend, right, which apparently you have never heard of. I hadn't heard of it, but coincidentally, that is the plot of a movie later this year. That's that's relevant and interesting, right? I mean, well, maybe so maybe this was right just in. the height of of the the alligator urban myth, you know that maybe. Well. Uh, there was a famous story here in which an alligator was released in, I believe it was Echo Park. Um, and people had seen it and it had been a, trying to attack small oh, dogs. Oh, and they drained the whole Echo I, Park, the lake, I, didn't they? But like, like they had like Crocodile Hunter tried to come and get him <laughs> and all this stuff. Really? Uh, as I, I remember it, this. It yeah. wasn't that long ago. It was like three or four years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it also couldn't have been Crocodile. He would, have, he would have passed away. Or maybe he had tried to get it. I'm trying to... F- figure out because his name's reggie uh but anyway they caught him the crocodile's name is reggie yeah yeah uh they caught him uh and uh but yeah he had uh been living in the lake because someone had had pet a pet alligator and couldn't keep him so they just let it loose oh my god (laughs) and it grew just how do you feel if you read on the news later like oh an alligator climbed out of echo park lake and ate a two-year-old that was walking with its parents it's like jesus like why did you do that um so Obviously, this is a modern, this is like the 
the urban legend is this you yes know? yeah uh these weird scenarios but uh but like <laughs> like you said it must have been a part of uh popular culture that that rumor to the point that someone was like i'm gonna write the movie version of that well i mean this this reggie alligator wasn't until two it says 2005 to 2007 here yeah. oh okay but i'm sure that there are incidents before that especially you know in yeah. new york but you know that that is a classic urban legend that probably predated any actual alligators being in sewers i don't know you don't know how long sewers and alligators have been around I feel like it's also like one of those things like a city would do. It's like we got so many rats in the sewers. What can we do? What if? Yeah. <laughs> we release. It's like a Mao. Like here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. Um, yeah. If you if you give a sewer an alligator, <laughs> it'll ask for a glass of milk. All right. So Wikipedia is telling me 1930s is the origin of that urban legend. That's when the sewers moved under the streets instead of. Just on both sides of that in a trough of garbage. Trough, yeah. with gold. <laughs> Urine. <laughs> Tommy uh, and the kid and Luca Brazzi go to a movie theater. <laughs> and the kid goes up to buy a ticket and the lady's like, "Why? where's your father? And he's like, he's right over there. And she's like, okay, $3. <laughs> it's like, why are you selling this kid tickets to a porno movie theater? Because they go inside and it's a porno. Yeah. As it's long a... as you go to porns with your dad, it's totally acceptable. Well, why, you why should could... bring along a mentally incompetent. Yeah. <laughs> why couldn't Wacko be the dad? Yeah. Like, why has why he never thought of this before? Because Wacko seemed to have no problem with this yeah. either. But uh, so the three of them sit there and they don't leave when Tommy no. figures out what they're watching. He's just like, oh, <laughs> this snarky kid. Uh, and like zip. He, he puts on his glasses like, hold on a second. <laughs> I need to focus on yeah. this. We show, we show the souls for a second just throwing garbage at a street cleaner going yeah. by at night. Just, just hammer home that these are terrible people that like even people just working their jobs for the city are just getting assaulted for no reason. Yeah, Everyone in this neighborhood is afraid of this gang. Yeah. Uh, Marsha answers the door in her underwear again. And Tommy asks her if she would like to go on a date. And she's like, well, I'm busy right now. And he's like, well, will you still be busy later? And she's like, well, no, I could maybe 8 o'clock. I was just going to say 8 o'clock. You were a legitimate phenomenon. So when he goes to pick her up, she looks exactly like Zool. (laughs) She's just wearing like the exact Zool costume from Ghostbusters. And he takes her to a bowling alley where she immediately covers up with a coat because she's embarrassed about being overdressed. Uh, but I like this montage of her just being terrible at bowling and then finally, like... Gets one strike. Gets and... one strike. And everyone, like, all the league people are, like, yeah. crowd around her and are cheering <laughs> her on. I was like, okay, I wrote, this is cute. <laughs> <laughs> so after they go bowling, he takes her to the docks and shows her a boat. It's not his boat. Nope. Because he doesn't have a boat. If he did, mm-hmm. he would be on it. So this is just a boat. Yeah, th- th- this isn't like Romancing the Stone where he has a picture of the with the Angelina or the something. The boat like. that he wants to get back. Yeah. It's it's literally just a boat. And maybe it's a particular like style of boat that he likes. It looks like a museum boat. <laughs> it doesn't look like a <laughs> boat you actually take out. Yeah. But um, she's like, oh, so you like boats? And he's like, yeah, one day I'm going to get on a boat and I'm just going to sail out of here and I'm never going to come back. And it's like, yeah, that's, it's called shipwrecking. <laughs> it means you dive. <laughs> But then we cut to them in her bed, presumably just after sex. And she says, so you served in the Navy? And he says, yeah. And she's like, you spend a lot of time on these boats with just other men? And he's like, yeah, there's no women. It's just men. And she's like, and and you just, don't you get lonely? And he's like, well, no, we just sleep together in in beds. And she's like, really? And he's like, well, yeah. Sometimes, you know, you're out at sea for a long time. Why do I believe you, you and then she just immediately like thinks that oh well he's obviously joking so I'm gonna beat him up because yeah. that's that's not funny to me. And she calls him Irish, and and it's like is, is he Irish? I, I I don't know. What is uh? Can we look up Jan Michael Vincent's nationality or ethnicity? Don't read too much about his Wikipedia though. <laughs> is it is it dark as I think it is? It's pretty dark. Multiple drug. Uh, drunken drug arrests, car crashes, DUIs, abusive husband. Yeah. Uh, he in and out of rehab. Was like, oh man. I know he had a lot of problems. This is a very sad story. He kind of looks like um, 
if you took Rowdy Roddy Piper and you took away his steroids and you gave him a wasting disease. See, I I, I, I was comparing him to like the poor man Scott Glenn. Okay. Because like this is definitely a Scott Glenn role. Sure. I am not fighting his nationality, but his grandfather was a bank robber and counterfeiter in the 1920s and 30s. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Maybe he started the rumor about the alligators. <laughs> That was in the 30s, he said. <laughs> that was his long con. <laughs> the long con. His grandfather's still waiting. Some say he's still waiting to leap out at a child <laughs> from a sewer grate. Give me your money. <laughs> I'm an alligator. Give me your money. What do you need money, alligator? <laughs> Come on, <Andrew. laughs> I'm 140 years old. <laughs> this was a bad plan. Tommy finds the a group of the souls attacking Wacko in an alley. It's, this is basically the same thing as throwing garbage at the street cleaner because he's not doing anything to anyone. He's literally just walking through the alley and they're beating him up. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have anything they want. Uh, they just think it's funny to hit a retarded kid. A, a adult. Yeah. And so he intervenes mm-hmm. on Wacko's behalf. The kid's not around. Um, and... He stops the fight, and basically Danny Aiello sees it happening from across the alley, and he's like, oh, I forgot we could do that. That's so cool. We can fight back? Good for that guy. Question mark? Yeah. He goes home, and there's like 10 rats strung up like decorations over the doorway to his apartment, and they spray painted the bird's souls on the wall in his living room. Like, it was already a garbage heap of an apartment. Who cares that it says souls on the wall? Yeah, the rats were a mild improvement. I mean, I just want to see the shot of like them catching ten rats mm-hmm. and then painstakingly tying, tying them their up. little feet onto the tap, string. Tap, tap, little nails hang across the roof. Up. And uh, it just seems like so much more work to hang them up than it would be to take them down. Or to just trash the place. Like, don't hang up rats. Like, just, yeah. just, just be it, like, you know, it was actually really, It was actually really easy. They just hung up flypaper and the rats just got themselves oh, there stuck. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> climbing on the ceiling. Also, rats are a very specific message in, like, the gang and criminal underworld. Mm-hmm. And he's not a rat. He didn't call the police on them. Right, right. He, all he did was intervene in a fight on someone's behalf. Like, a rat is the wrong the wrong symbol for this disagreement. Should have put a horse head in his bed. Yeah, there should have been <laughs> ten horse heads strung up <laughs> across <laughs> the doorway. Um, but then Danny Aiello stops him on the sidewalk and he's like, hey, let's go get drunk. And I was sure this was the beginning of a trap. Oh, totally. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he gets him like falling down drunk. Yeah. I was like, and this is and it. I was like, oh, here it comes. Here's where the rest of the guys are going to come out and attack him. And no, they're just the best of friends. It's, now. it's, <laughs> it's like he's impressed. They, they buried the hatchet by going out drinking classic guy stuff. Who cares um, about the fish? It's all yeah. good. I'm not even mad at you for getting my fish away from that thief and giving it back to me. <laughs> Wait, why was I mad at you? It's a very it's very similar to Hudson Hawk when Danny Aiello like comes clean and yeah. Richard E. Grant is like is like or Sandra Bird is like, they'll talk about chugging brewskis and it's like you gotta love male bonding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the, the he uh while they're drinking, um, he takes him to the sportsman clubhouse, basically. And uh, he says, "Oh yeah, that that was the name of my gang, and we were we were real tough guys, and but now the the neighborhood's ruined, and uh, everything's gone to crap." And uh, and they kind of part ways at the end of the night, completely stinking drunk in an alleyway, while Danny Aiello's wife is like, "Hey, come in here. What are mm-hmm. you doing out there, Carmine?" Um, and he's like, "All right, I'm coming, Gracie." And then uh, he goes inside. Then we cut to like neighborhood bingo night going on. The entire neighborhood is there. Everyone in the whole <laughs> building. Everyone that we've seen so far yeah. is staring out of a balcony or window. Yeah, all of them are sitting room, down playing, playing bingo. bingo. Well, we got some new characters here too. Oh yeah, well, we, got a, a we got the priest that's that's like calling out got, the numbers. Yeah. Polly Walnuts is sitting there right. playing. And uh, uh, Fats Williams, Chino Fats Williams. Chino Fats Williams. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's great. He's got the greatest one. I, I can't even do it. He got that voice. Like his voice is so <laughs> is so crazy. Um, cause like, you know, he was in, um, he's in one of the best scenes ever in weird science when they go to the, the, the clubhouse the club, and they just, all of a sudden they're all just friends with everybody. Yeah. Called him every night. Every, every damn, damn night. night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, he also played the security guard, <laughs> the great line. In we should Joker. specify Fats is not the one who says that every damn night. Line, no, no, no. He's one of those the people around the table. So, but he's in Jumbo Jack Flash, and she, uh, Whoopi Goldberg is like high on true serum, and he and he, he she grabs him from the desk. Is like you need to lose some weight, <laughs> and he goes, "I lost five pounds last month." <laughs> <laughs> like he's like really upset about I'm it. Trying like, really hard. <laughs> she didn't notice. Anyway, so I was really excited when I because his, his voice is so distinctive. You sure. Can't not notice it who it is. Uh, but in the middle of the bingo night, the souls attack, um, and it doesn't. It's not even like they're going after like necessarily the prize money like yeah, well, directly. They're, they're saying everything. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're and including like a woman that's there that they're yeah. just like you are ours now. We're taking you as our property, and uh, he like rips her shirt off when he has her against the mm-hmm. wall. And she's wearing the same wardrobe as Teresa Saldana has been wearing for the entire movie now. Um, and uh, and then the priest steps up and he's like, you got to get out of here. Like, God commands you to get out of here. Mm-hmm. Like, he's performing an exorcism on this guy to get him out of the room. Um, he's like, you're doomed to hell and, and you shouldn't be in here. Like, it's a church or something. It's like, no, you're gambling might here. Be. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't sure. A lot sure. of churches do bingo. Yeah, Maybe. but I, yeah, I mean, this kind of looked like a like a rec room somewhere, but I, who knows? I, I thought it was like a community room in the building or in the complex that they live in. But I like that Carmine, when they're taking his wallet, is like, can I at least take my kids' pictures out? Yeah. And he's like, no, no, I'll take good care of them. I love kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when the priest is yelling at him, I, I for a second thought he was going to rip that guy's shirt off. <laughs> um, but uh, they have the woman against the wall, and that's when Carmine steps in, and he's like, mm-hmm. hey, hey, let go of the girl. Like, the, the, what you when you're going you're stepping over the line and they just beat the crap out of him yeah. and throw him to the ground. Car- Carmine takes a lot of hits in this movie. Yeah, he takes the most convincing hits. Yeah, Tommy doesn't take a single convincing hit. But yeah, so in the aftermath of this uh, bingo robbery, everybody's kind of beat up. the The woman basically Aiello protected her by intervening because they kind of drop her. They're they're yeah. not interested in her anymore, and the police come. But everyone refuses to file a police report about the gang because they know that they'll face retribution. And the cop seems like really like disinterested in even taking a report should right. a report be filed. Yeah, they're like, we're only asking for a report because we know no one's going to file one. Because we, we would like to do less work here. And then Danny Aiello says, well, maybe I'll get a gun. And he's like, what's that? What did you say? And he's like, maybe I'll get a gun to protect myself. And he's like, Cause yeah, you try America. and get a gun, and uh, I'm gonna beat you up, <laughs> or I'll take your gun away, and you're gonna go to jail. And yeah. it's like, no, no, no. What no, about no. what about this gang that's been carrying around guns around our neighborhood yeah. that you aren't doing anything about? Not just guns, but like vintage Lugers. Yeah, <laughs> it's all just whatever they could find on the floor at the prop house <laughs> that didn't have a tag on it, so that meant they could take it for the weekend. I Man, um, I, like, I like your style, Angel, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So eventually. Um, Abe decides, you know what, I've dealt with this for long enough, and if I can't fight back physically, I can fight back using the legal system, and I'm going to file a report. So um, they put him in the car, and they're like, oh, crap, now we got to fill out some paperwork because someone's actually filing a report. Mm-hmm. So they take him down to the station, and uh, the next day, Aiello and some of the other sportsmen decide, oh, this is great. We're going to fight back against this gang. Mm-hmm. You're with us, right, Tommy? And he's like, no, no, no. I don't care about you you people. Like, this is my neighborhood. They can do whatever they want. I don't care. Yeah. Which is really weird because he is, like, turning on a dime from having, like, defended people from this gang already multiple times in this movie. But essentially he says, this isn't my fight. You guys got to take care of your own yeah. stuff. This this is in the wake of, like, Abe getting beaten up and then... No, not yet. I, really? I thought that this talk about taking back the streets comes back later. Well, it's kind of cutting back and forth. Okay. But um, the sportsmen are trying to recruit him, and he says no. And meanwhile, uh, that's, like we're cross-cutting with Teresa Saldana is in the grocery store trying to buy something. And Abe says, oh, I think that's in the back. Why don't you go go ahead and grab it? And uh, sh- does she want to make a phone call or something? And she starts to use the phone when the gang comes in. Just beats the crap out and, of Abe. And then Abe like stumbles in like yeah, totally. He, he's like covered in blood and wanders into the back room where she hid when she heard the gang come in. But he's fine. He survives. Yeah, he survives. Yeah. There's no stakes in this movie ever. Yeah. They like keep, every they time they keep pulling punches all over the place. Like sometimes, literally in these fight scenes that are very mm-hmm. badly choreographed. But it's like there's no reason this guy didn't die. 
Not, it, it has no bearing on the rest of the movie. We literally never see this character again. Right. He should have just died from these wounds. Like, it should have been, you need to raise the stakes a lot because these guys aren't being evil enough. It's it, They're just taking money occasionally. Because the next beat-up is also doesn't isn't enough. Yeah. Like, it, it takes, like, another beat-up after yeah. that. They so, even go too far, but we'll get so, to Yeah, so, but the next thing that happens is basically, um, she, uh, what is the, her name? Marsha. Marsha is upset about uh, Abe having been beat up, and she's also complaining that she's, she's trying to grow flowers in her apartment and there's not enough sunlight, mm-hmm. which is, I think, a heavy-handed metaphor for everything's terrible in this neighborhood yeah. and everything dies. And so they're like, well, you know where there is sunlight? On the roof. So they build her, him and Wacko and the kid build her a really nice garden. Actually, Tommy doesn't really take part in the building yeah, much yeah. at all. But the other two build her a really nice garden. And then they're like, look, we made you a garden on the roof so that you can finally grow plants. You're never going to guess what happens to this garden. Immediately. <laughs> like, yes, right. within 12 hours. Like, how did the Solos even find out about it? I, yeah, they have they like just satellite wander around footage. on the roofs of all the apartment buildings just in case somebody had to make a new garden that day. Somebody trying to be sustainable around here. <laughs> we'll show them how we treat the sustainable people. And then we beat up this kid, too. Because why yeah. not? Also, why is the kid there defending a bunch of zucchinis? It's like, just go downstairs. Yeah. Don't, don't stand up to a gang when they're beating up a tomato patch. It's not worth it. But they destroy the garden and beat the kid up. And basically, Tommy finds out about it and gets upset enough that he's decides he's going to face off with the gang mm-hmm. one-on-one. He's going to go confront them. Yeah. And, and so he, he finds three of them playing a basketball game. Right. And uh, he starts to... when he, First, they're just arguing, but when he starts to actually fight one of them, uh, the third guy realizes, oh, this fight is not going to go our way. I can already tell. Yeah. And he leaves. Mm-hmm. And Tommy's able to capably handle the other two guys. And it cuts the guy's ponytail off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Axel yeah. Rose loses yeah. his ponytail. And so, uh, <laughs> which is, again, it's just like, well, just, it, just a simple fight. Yeah. But the, the cutting off of the ponytail is like a symbol. Is symbol. Yeah. It's, it's symbol. an act of defiance. defiance. That's four acts of defiance <laughs> for those keeping track. Well, in the, so getting back into uh, Old West times. Yes. Is it scalping time? Is well, that yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, like having long hair meant that no one had scalped you. So, like, Wild Bill had notoriously long hair. Uh, oh, okay. Because he, you know, it was it was a means of intimidating the Indians. Doesn't having a scalp mean no, that no one has scalped you? <laughs> like, just having hair at all? Yeah. Well, or but being having, alive? Having very long hair is like you're being prideful about it. Yeah. So he was, like, cutting his hair, like, to show, hey... You're, you've lost your, yeah. your sense of pride. People aren't going to think that you haven't been scalped now. <laughs> They're going to think you got a haircut. <laughs> Take that, gang member. So the the soul leader finds out about the guy who ran away from the fight and basically lectures him on abandoning his brothers, mm-hmm. puts a gun in his mouth, and click. It's not loaded because no one can die in this movie and nothing matters. <laughs> yeah. What is the reason to not kill this guy in front of everyone? Show that you're a badass. And and, why, and he just pulls the gun out, not loaded. So do you just not keep this gun loaded? Well, Jesus Christ, that's super unsafe, Richard. <laughs> of course he doesn't load this gun. Or he just keeps... The, the first one is an empty round. <laughs> so he can always make this example? <laughs> yeah. So or so that he can it. gain the upper hand by pulling the trigger, pointing it at someone he wants to kill. And then when they're like... Oh, his gun's empty. Then the second one kills the first yeah. one. He's like, ah, I killed him Strategy. right when he was. He had such high hopes for this fight. But yeah, so he pretends to shoot this guy, and then that's the end of the punishment. He's just like, there, you, you've served your your dues, and we're all a gang again. Now we're gonna go harass this guy, but not do anything. Yeah, while he's in the shower. Yeah, because he's we're very really intimidated by his penis. <laughs> this makes no sense. This is where I officially like got mad at the movie. <laughs> The, the leader of the gang, not even like a, a random henchman, but a, the leader of the gang goes to Tommy's apartment and kicks open the door that he like fortified. Like there's a yeah. whole scene of him fortifying the door. Mm-hmm. It serves no purpose because they just the, push it in. The door is made of like paper. Yeah. He walks right into his bathroom, throws open the curtain. He's got a gun. He's in the bathroom with mm-hmm. Tommy. And he says, hey, I'm going to kill you. Not right Not now. Not today. <laughs> 
maybe tomorrow or maybe another time. And then he leaves. <laughs> Weather permitting. <laughs> why? Why? Unless he's scared to kill someone. Like, has he literally never killed a person? Ooh, you're adding a whole new layer to this. Is this you're guy, thinking like, far too much about this? Because <laughs> otherwise, kill Tommy. Like, just kill Tommy right here. Prove it's, to your gang that you're the leader and kill this man. Yeah, They're it'll be like a father here. son thing. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I got so mad at the scene because it was just like... Because you're yelling, kill him! Just kill just the guy, kill just him. kill him! Because it's it's just bad writing to be like, oh, you know what? This isn't a long enough movie. Let's put another, let's put another step in between these two scenes where he calls him out in his bathroom while he's naked yeah. and says, I'm going to kill you eventually. But maybe, see, isn't that reason. a more compelling movie where he does get killed and then the neighborhood comes together? Like this yeah, man absolutely. Stood, this yeah. man stood up if for us. If anybody died in this movie. We've honestly narrowly avoided like six decent movies <laughs> on the way to this movie. <laughs> Whew. Oh my so God. Close. Did you guys see that classic back there? <laughs> Jesus, that was close. Watch where you're going. <laughs> now Marsha has birds. Um, <laughs> you say it he, like it's a disease. Yeah. <laughs> she got she, birds. She got bird flu. <laughs> From Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got birds. You better get screened. I just, These are the goals. I just went through a whole bottle of bird shampoo. <laughs> this isn't possible. I've been very careful. <laughs> but yeah, he goes to her apartment and she has a cage full of birds. And uh, she named them after them. Because they're love birds? I don't know. Yeah, but she didn't they're actually not... name them after them. Yeah, she, yeah. she named the one after him and the other one after a fake name person. Yeah. And they're not lovebirds. They are parakeets. Yeah. <laughs> That's what lovebirds are. Um, if they love each other. Any <laughs> any birds that are in love are lovebirds. Or humans, apparently, too. Um, I've heard people use that phrase. But yeah, uh, she has these birds and he's like, oh, that's so cute. You named birds after us. By the way, I'm leaving. I'm going to go away forever. But she already knew. Because she right. found his like sh- ship detail crew thing. Yeah, in and his, then she like hit his it. His semen license. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> his concealed carry semen license. <laughs> oh, thank God he has semen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, um, so he tells her, I'm leaving town and I'm never coming back. And she starts crying. Um and and then laughing because she's yeah. like she's like essentially going insane yeah she's pulling she's going full ophelia here yes and just losing her mind that her she's lover. about to lay down in a river <laughs> and uh and then wacko presumably inspired by tommy attacking the souls um puts on his boxing outfit from mm-hmm. when he used to be the champ and starts a fight with them yeah um and is promptly killed yeah he accidentally hits angel and accidentally it's well, like he well, dressed up as a boxer to go punch well, the souls I, I and he accidentally punched one of them but it seems like the that wild punch was meant for someone else and they died sure so you think he had like an order of operations he yeah was, what I, is it pemdos look no, look if you're gonna start a fight you don't start with the leader because then you gotta face all these other guys that's true unless it's one of those like you know the, the night of the king. snake <laughs> Punch him out, and, they and everybody else just vaporizes. <laughs> <laughs> what if that happened? What if they literally were souls? But uh, so yeah, they kill Wacko. I don't know if they throw him off the building because this fight seems to be taking place on a roof, right? Oh, um, I think it's at street level. Because is it a street level? Maybe it is. Yeah. Either way, his body's in the garbage. In the, the garbage. Day. Yeah. And the kid is crying over it, and there's a crowd standing around it when Tommy's taxi is going by, and then he tells the driver, "Hey, hold on, pull over," and then he goes and checks it out and he's like okay finally someone died i can care about anything which is exactly where i was at finally something happened in this movie we can get started with act two yeah (laughs) and uh and he decides you know what i'm gonna hit him where it hurts i'm gonna go screw up his car mess up his car i'm gonna key it I'm gonna put a potato in the the tailpipe yeah banana if i have one full axle fully on this shit (laughs) and uh he he goes and he gets a bat and just starts beating up the car yeah. in a parking lot. He's got a sledgehammer. Oh, he's he has a sledgehammer. Yeah. Danny Aiello yeah. has the bat. But I love this scene because like Danny Aiello like puts his hand on his shoulder like to stop him, and then whoosh, like, just kidding, I'm not on their team. I, I re- reveals it. I got a bat. We're gonna do some more work, and then the other guys show up. Guy yeah. with chains, which doesn't seem very effective. Yeah, but uh, oh, it's great for distressing wood. <laughs> not so great for breaking up a car. 
Well, who knows? Maybe they're doing a little uh, remodeling also. <laughs> but they, yeah, they, they go like it's totally like Street Fighter in between, just like tearing yeah. down this car. <laughs> yeah, this is you, what you need is an E Honda to just punch the crap out of it, or a Blanca, Blanca to electrocute. Just electrocute it. And then like, the guy goes, "Oh my god." <laughs> That's basically what he says. We we see uh, a few shots of uh, Angel in the in the club again, just like dis- hearing hearing his car alarm go off in the distance. Oh, the whole, like the horn was stuck on. Yeah, <laughs> basically that's all that happens here. Um, Danny Aiello goes back to the sportsman and says, "Hey guys, we're fighting back. Like we're 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 teamed up. But Tommy's on our side now, and we can." We can go do this together. Yeah, he made his jacket to suit up. Right, but everyone's still too scared, including Polly Walnuts is just like buries his head in his hands. Mm-hmm. Um, none of them are interested in participating in this fight. Uh, but eventually... Paolo, I think, is like the, the one guy who goes, I'm ashamed yeah. that I haven't done anything. Yeah. So I'm and, going. And then you get the slow clap of everybody joining in. And uh, they all line up. And it's basically the fight scene from Anchorman. Yeah. Where just like... a group of like four people will show up at a time and you're just like who are these people i don't know who are these people oh it's channel 12 like, like well what i love is then like old people just start coming out on the thing and just everyone's just lobbing garbage some guy throws a bike <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, right that's my bike um and then the kid throws a molotov yeah cocktail. the kid is on, a, on the rooftop throwing literal bombs into a street fight but they they all face off and it literally looks like like the way it's shot is almost exactly how the shot the they shot the fight scenes from Anchorman yeah. and Anchorman Two in Central Park. Yeah. Well, what I thought was going to happen was because because Angel sees that he's outnumbered and going to lose this fight, so he runs, and Tommy goes after him. What I thought was going to happen was the gang was going to go, okay, we're done. We're gonna we're gonna lay down arms because we can't win this. Nope. Everyone just starts wailing on yeah. each other. But it's, but this fight lasts for like. 15, 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, while Tommy and Angel are just brutalizing each other in every yeah. way possible. Oh, Carmine gets shot, too. Yeah, that. Carmine gets shot, but uh, the reason you didn't mention it is because it's irrelevant. <laughs> it's like he is shot basically in like the collarbone. Yeah, and he's okay. And just stands up immediately and is fine. Um, they put a little like a little patch on him and he's good. Mm. But yeah, this, this Tommy and Angel fight... Just rolls through the entire apartment building, yeah, through go, people's rooms. Yeah, and, they go all the way up the, to the top of the building just so they can tumble all the way down the yeah. stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they end up like tumbling down the steps out of the front of the building, slamming into a car that's parked in front of the building. And at this point, the police have shown up and mm-hmm. basically arrested everybody. Um, actually, everybody on one team. <laughs> For some yeah, reason, yeah. they know the people from the neighborhood obviously had nothing to do with this, but they can tell who the souls are and and uh who isn't in the gang and uh all the gang members have been arrested and one at a time they each stand up and they're like i'll file a report i'll file her i'm spartacus well well, and tommy (laughs) stops just short of killing angel because he sees that everyone's watching yeah um i have no doubt in my mind he was going to kill him yes um but then angel just kind of like gives himself up yeah he kind of goes like he surrenders i'm done um, I, I don't want to be out with this guy anymore. Yeah, and then we cue the the bargain bin Bruce Springsteen revenge song <laughs> for the credits to play over, um, and that's the end of our film. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that Spike Lee saw this movie and was like, "This is wrong and bad, but I could do this better, mm-hmm. and I'll still use Danny, Danny Aiello <laughs> 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 because this is." Not super far off from the premise of Do the Right Thing, Mm -hmm. which is more along the lines of there are opposing gangs and you're seeing things from everyone's perspective and seeing how the the hate in this neighborhood just multiplies itself. And uh, and, uh, Danny Aiello is like the store owner, right? Uh, no, he he's just he, a he guy. runs the pizzeria, but he's part of like the. Oh, Italian... oh okay. I thought, I thought we were talking about Defiance. No, yeah, oh, yeah. It, He runs the pizzeria, yeah, yeah. that uh, he works for. But I wouldn't be surprised if that, at, at, if we can say anything good about this movie, it's that it might have inspired part of Do the Right Thing mm-hmm. to to exist. This was directed by John Flynn, who did a bunch of lower budget action movies. Nothing I recognized. Lock Up with Stallone. Out for Justice with Steven Seagal. Yeah, uh, the, the, not not even their famous movies. The writer Thomas Michael Donnelly. This was his first screenplay. He also wrote Quicksilver with Kevin Bacon, 
which is one of the off-brand MCU movies, like mm-hmm. uh, Nightcrawler with Jake <laughs> Gyllenhaal. The story was written by Mark Tulin with Thomas Michael Donnelly. Tulin doesn't have a lot of credits, but he plays the bass guitarist of the sinking ship in the Poseidon Adventure. Yeah. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah, the original Poseidon Adventure. Yes. Because the remake. We don't was, acknowledge what, the remake. Very okay. recently, right? <laughs> J. Michael Vincent was Tommy. Uh, he's probably best known for Airwolf. Airwolf. <laughs> <laughs> which he was in the TV movie and then it was adapted into a series and he right. continued to play the same Stringfellow character. Stringfellow Hawk. Uh, he's also Tanner in Damnation Alley. Um, <laughs> whenever I think of Airwolf, I think of on uh, C-Lab when he would watch Airwolf, but it was literally he turns into a wolf <laughs> in the plane. <laughs> um, or the helicopter or whatever it was. It was a helicopter. Um, How dare you? Whatever. Oh, I just, I've never seen a single episode of Airwolf, and I'm very happy about that after <laughs> having seen this movie. He's also in Big Wednesday. Honestly, for, for my money, his best performance was in Buffalo 66, mm. which is... Post all of his rehabilitation, he's the guy that runs the bowling alley. Oh, okay. Who kept Vincent Gallo's locker in place. And I think there was a gun in it. Yeah, he doesn't and all play a very stuff. big role. It's a very small role, but, and he seems like like he's having trouble talking. But um, well, See, I haven't seen Hooper, which is one of the credits, where he it's a semi-buddy film with him and uh, Burt Reynolds. I haven't seen that either, but yeah. I would watch that. Yeah, it's like they're both stuntmen, Hollywood stuntmen. Oh, interesting. And uh, it's just like, they first are rivals, but then become friends, and they... uh, Because both of them are pretty famous for doing their own stunts. Yeah, and so I'm kind of curious about that movie. That was 78, so... Okay. um, I might try to find that. Yeah, that might be worth looking into. Uh, Teresa Saldana, we covered earlier, um, as Marsha. She's the wife of Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull. She's the voice of Mame Slaughter on Captain Planet, and Estella Velasquez on Johnny Quest. And she was also in an episode of MacGyver. She mm. was the love interest in The Treasure of Manco, oh. where Corn uh, was their treasure. Yes, Corn. <laughs> uh, Danny Aiello is Carmine. He's Sal and Do the Right Thing. Uh, he's Police Chief Aiello in Once Upon a Time in America. <laughs> Very creative naming. He's Tony in The Professional. Uh, is he? Yeah. Well, there you go. Leon The Professional. Yes. He's great. Hudson Hawk, we already mentioned. Yes. He, Tommy Five Tone, Hudson Hawk. He's also Papa in the Papa Don't Preach music video. Oh, yeah. Um, Rudy Ramos was Angel Cruz, uh, who was also in MacGyver. He was Pete Torgut in Hellfire, who I think is the one who gets his leg broken. Right, right, right. He, uh, he played Ignacio in Beverly Hills Cop 2, um, and he worked with Thomas Michael Donnelly again on Quicksilver. I think Thomas Michael Donnelly wrote and directed that one, mm. so... Um, Lenny Montana is Wacko and Luca Brazzi. Um, he was also a con man in The Jerk. And he co wrote a horror film called Blood Song in 1982. Just an old fashioned blood song. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That song is actually about this movie. But they accidentally sang it wrong. It's really embarrassing. It's super expensive. <laughs> I, I looked up the premise and it's like a uh, serial killer, like is trying to find a woman who received some of his blood in a transfusion to kill her so that he's the (laughs) only person with his own blood um (laughs) something like that that's actually really awesome (laughs) well especially written by luca brazzi like i want to watch that um yeah no one takes my blood i I would be shocked if it got a wide release but i think we'll make a special exception for blood song when we get there (laughs) um art carney was abe his final role was as Frank in Last Action Hero, mm. which I think is the cop who had retired and was in the house that exploded. Well, it was his his favorite his like favorite second cousin or something yeah. like that. <laughs> That's my favorite second cousin. <laughs> He's got the time bomb in his house, though. Yeah, um, and it blows up right as they're coming around the corner. Yeah. Um, more famously, obviously, more famous for Bernard Crawford in Muppets Take Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Some people might know him as Ed Norton on The Honeymooners, which I think is. For sure, what mm-hmm. people know him from. Um, he was Harry in Harry and Tonto, which he got an Oscar for lead actor. He was the Archer on the '60s Batman. I don't know the Archer. I'm not familiar no, with that sure. character. Uh, um, I mean, I know him from Firestarter. Him and uh, Louise Fletcher were like an old couple that Charlie ends up with at the end. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's in one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes. Yeah, the Night of the Meek. Yeah. Which is the Santa one? He's mm-hmm. like a fired Santa. Yeah, and then he becomes the real Santa. Spoiler alert. Yeah. And it was one of those weird ones that was shot on uh, video. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and they did th- they did that now and then. Um, but it had the voice of uh, Piglet, which we've had 
previously yes. in Midnight Madness. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was in that episode. In the same one? Yeah, in the same episode. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought he was in a different one. And uh, Santos Morales was Paolo, who plays the telegrapher in The Three Amigos. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who's like... I'll put infamous El Guapo. Infamous? See, si. It means uh, murderous, evil, all like you said. And it will save you money. <laughs> Thank you. He's also a bartender in Back to School, and he plays Waldo in Scarface. Don Blakely was Abby, who is Floyd Wilson's trainer in Pulp Fiction. And he will come back as Jerome Boyd and Brubaker later this year. And uh, Tony Sirico plays Davey, which I don't remember them even saying the character's name, but that's Polly Walnuts from Sopranos. And he also plays Tony Stacks in Goodfellas. Okay, up or down, Jess? Oh, it's down. I'm really conflicted um, because I love a good, just cheesy... uh, death wishy kind of movie but i'm gonna give it a down i i agree i like the like revenge and like john wick type stuff but it needs to go all the way and Mm -hmm. this movie was holding back so much it's a definite down for me um richard where does this go in your letterbox (laughs) i'm gonna call on you first so that you don't have to feel Um, like you're copying jess you know um i'm gonna put this uh uh above simon and just below uh hero at large okay huh all right you liked this movie better than I did. Uh, I'm putting it just above To All a Good Night and just below Don't Answer the Phone. Okay. I'm still questioning in my head, is this better or worse than Fatso? I think it's worse, which puts it at the bottom of my list. Wow. Really? I think this is the worst movie for me so far. If only for that one bathroom scene was enough to just totally kill it for me. Hmm. But... Um, because at least Fatso like had some jokes in it. There's no jokes in this movie. And no, it's, yeah, no, it was not. It's not a comedy. And I, and I don't think it, it was Fatso capably made. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so yeah, I think that goes at the bottom for me. Um, I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Whereas I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. And please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. If you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintagevideopodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we will be discussing Forbidden Zone, the bizarre and musical tale of a girl who travels to another dimension through the gateway found in her family's basement. We leave you now with the trailer for Forbidden Zone. Just keep saying to yourself, it's only a movie. It's only a movie. It's only a movie that will have you living in the sixth dimension. Moving in the wrong direction. A new fantasy musical comedy. The Forbidden Zone.